Hi, my name is Christy Taylor, and this is my presentation for Comms 532. I will be discussing Irving Janus's theory of groupthink and how that applies to interpersonal communication. Uh, groupthink was made famous by psychologist Irving Janus, um, and it was uh, is synonymous with George Orwell's um, doublethink, as uh, discussed in his novel 1984. The term was first introduced by William White in a 1952 issue of For uh, Fortune magazine. And his definition um, is such that it is uh, a rationalized conformity of an open philosophy that holds group values to be expedient, right, and good. His theory is supported by three underpinnings. Those three underpinnings are that moral values of the group are relative, that what is important is the behavior that allows for harmonious functioning of the group, and that the best way to achieve this is through scientific technique. He states that the downfall of groupthink is that the individual willingly submits himself to being a pawn in the game um, of, of observation rather than um, being active in, in um, avoiding that. Um, oftentimes the individuals involved in groupthink are doing so to maintain a sense of security in their social setting. Um, be that a workplace or um, a social setting, it is, it is imperative to them that they maintain their social standing. Uh, White applied this theory of groupthink to literature, film, education, and social settings, um, and that's going to be expanded upon here in just a moment. Um, Janice expands on White's theory and uses Orwell's term as well, providing a definition of groupthink to be a quick and easy way to refer to the term of thinking that persons engage in when concurrent seeking uh, becomes so dominant in a cohesive in-group that it tends to override realistic appraisal of alternative actions. Um, so groupthink um, essentially is going to occur most often when a um, when members of a groupthink environment um, are discouraged from criticizing their peers um, or their superior. Now it's interesting because typically as groups grow in comfort levels with each other, they are more apt to actually speak what's on their minds and share socially um, their opinions. And even if that means speaking out against something, they have the comfort and the security within their group to do so. Um, however, in the group think um, they're discouraged from doing so um, as they don't have a sense of, of security um, in that same setting. Groupthink is unique in that setting um, because as the cohesiveness of the group increases, the members of the group are less apt to speak out of the group out of a sense of loyalty. So just a little bit of uh, differentiation there between societal norms and what happens in a groupthink setting. Um, groupthink occurs most when a strong, persuasive leader steps into a group of highly cohesive um, people and there is pressure from an outside source um, to make the good and right decision, not only for those individuals, but for um, the larger good as well. well. We'll look at some of those decisions here in just a few minutes. Um, Janice provides eight symptoms of groupthink. Um, those symptoms include invulnerability, collective rationalization, a belief in, in, in the inherent morality of the group, uh, group stereotypes, direct pressure on dissenters, self-censorship, illusions of unanimity, and self-appointed mind guards. The products of groupthink um, include, but are not limited to, um, a limited discussion of action, typically narrowed down to just two choices, um, a failure to re-examine the course of action initially suggested, um, partnered with no additional attempt to obtain additional information, and then the members of that group showing increased interest in facts that support their policy and position, as opposed to finding outside information that might contrast with their opinions. Um, Janice provides some steps uh, in his initial theories, theorizations to avoid groupthink. Um, those include inclusion and encouragement of transparency, collusion with experts both inside of the field and outside of the field, as well as a clear expectation for a desired in, uh, outcome. Um, like I said, we would look at some famous examples of groupthink and how that's impacted the world and our society and our country specifically. 
Um, those are uh, President Johnson's handling of the Marshall Plan, the Bay of Pigs invasion, which did lead to public arrest of U.S. operatives in Cuba, and eventually led to their public imprisonment in Cuban prisons. Um, the U.S.'s lack or initial lack of response to the intel we received regarding the bombing of Pearl Harbor, um, the Watergate scandal, NASA's decision to launch the Challenger despite knowing that it had design flaws, uh, the, Saddam, uh, the hunt for Saddam Hussein, the collapses of both Swiss Air and Enron, as well as certain results of presidential elections. It can be argued that groupthink has had an impact in, uh, in all of these arenas. So going towards the literature review, um, one of the best articles that I found was by Turner and Perconis um, at the time of their publishing, which was in 1998. Um, less than two dozen empirical studies had been done on groupthink. And that is despite explaining, um, despite its popularity and attempting to explain why certain decisions had been made and why the outcomes of those decisions were not beneficial. Um, the reason for those um, is because it's hard to replicate a groupthink setting. Um, now, they, there are some empirical studies that have been done. One that I found um, discussed three interpretations of groupthink studies um, and how the outcomes can be, uh, dis I guess, uh, interpreted is the right word. Um, so those are interpretations are the first, uh, is a strict interpretation of the groupthink. Um, and that is when all antecedents for the groupthink are found in the study. The second is an additive groupthink, and that's um, that groupthink should become more prominent as the number of antecedents increases. And then the third is liberal outcome, and that is um, the outcome of the groupthink depends on the unique situations that are invoked by the antecedents in each individual situation. So they're saying essentially, we can't know what causes groupthink, but each each particular situation has a set of antecedents or a set of um, affects that cause certain outcomes. Um, there are also three phases of research progress um, that uh, Perconis and Turner reference as well. Um, those are following the introduction of the concept through direct tests um, with groupthink, um, following the extensions of the model, and reformulations of the model. Now, um, what they have said is that phase one and two studies uh, typically fail to provide hard and fast results, whereas um, the third type, which is the uh, reformulations of the model, actually tends to provide a lot more information because those are more focused on the antecedents rather than the outcome of groupthink. Um, and some of the theories um, and information that's come out of those studies include groupthink being reimagined as a collective optimism collective avoidance, and the influence of conformity and compliance on a group. Um, <clears throat> they state that studies rarely provide uh, full evidence on groupthink, while others can provide conflicting findings. And one of these, uh, one of the reasons is that groupthink group uh, studies tend to focus on the antecedents rather than the groups themselves. Um, one study done by Greenwald and Ronis asks the question of groupthink, um, they ask if the failure to replicate groupthink is an effect of a poor theory, a poor research, or perhaps both. Um, many studies uh, do mostly provide information on how to avoid groupthink um, in the group setting. Um, to Hart states that one of the first steps in preventing groupthink is to constitute what actually defines a good decision and what defines a bad decision. We've already talked about Janice's recommendations for avoiding groupthink. Um, so we'll move on from there and talk about um, the impact of groupthink in the educational setting, which is where um, I think a lot of current studies being done. Um, there's a, an article written by Susan Cain um, called The Rise of the New Groupthink. She actually discusses groupthink in terms of um, the introvert and the impact that it has on the introvert. She talks a lot about the introvert in the workplace, the school setting, the home setting, the social setting, the church setting. Um, so she, she says that she actually did a lot of interviews and a lot of studies. Um, one classroom in particular that she visited, students were grouped together in pods. You know, their desks are grouped together. Now, that's um, not uncommon uh, in today's educational settings. Most students are grouped together for the purpose of being able to discuss their questions and talk about what they're learning. However, in this particular classroom, the students were not allowed to ask a question 
unless all members of the group share the same question. And this actually discourages learning. Um, it discourages the individual being able to achieve success, and it focuses solely on the group. Um, now, she does discuss um, the role of education, like I've said, and how that can impact not only those individuals, but how education for young people really does start to impact all of us, because as they grow up, they're going to be the key decision makers. So we need to be performing and providing an environment that those students and those young learners can uh, share, can ask questions, and can um, reach a level of expertise. She says that individuals um, perform at a higher level, both quantitatively and qualitatively. Um, and so often in the idea of, of group success is much more important than the success of the individual. Um, some other ways to avoid groupthink in the workplace, um, creativity, open discussion, diversity, um, and those are just some simple ways. Now those are going to be clearly flushed out for any organization um, at hand, but they actually say too that research has shown that employees who work in an environment where groupthink is encouraged, employees in those environments are more likely to be stagnant apathetic and unresponsive to pressure from change. So we definitely see that groupthink is not uh, something that we should be striving towards. We should actually be discouraging it as much as possible. Um, we've seen the historical impacts. Obviously, President Kennedy's uh, invasion of the Bay of Pigs, um, he actually was able to learn from that and use um, his failure in the Bay of Pigs towards his decision-making process uh, with the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, so we can learn from that as well. Scripture tells us that in Romans 12, 12, we should not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but that we should be renewed by the transforming of our minds. We know that we have the Holy Spirit in us, and that Holy Spirit empowers us to speak out and to be bold. And so I believe that um, if and when we find ourselves in situations where think antecedents are starting to occur or groupthink is starting to become more prominent, we have the ability to rely on our faith to embolden us and to speak out against it. So it was definitely a huge learning experience for me. I heard the term groupthink before but didn't know much about it, so I really enjoyed learning about it, and I hope you guys did as well. I hope you guys have a great day.